Hi, Janet. Loretta. Who else is here? I see four, but I don't see four people. I only see you, Janet. That's only one, two. They've got their, um, I don't know. <laughs> their videos on. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm here. Is that you, Steve? Yes. Okay. So we got Janet and Steve, myself. No, I'm on my Zoom. Hi, Gwen. Hi, Gwen. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Hi. Hi. Um, I had to get my sound on. <laughs> uh huh. Sorry about that. How are y'all? I think we're all good. Hey, Gwen. Hey, hey Steve. Steve. It's been a while. Yeah, boy, it has. Hi, Ginger. <laughs> and Christine is Christine here oh right. and um, Bill and Stephanie aren't here either let's wait a minute for them Now, hopefully, Ginger, we won't have any trouble getting your uh, program up because I uh, talked with <clears throat> uh, Mike D'Amato and he said he had the screen share, screen share up. So you should be OK when we get to that, which will be in a few minutes. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem. I did send your um, program out to everybody, so everybody should have received it anyway. So OK. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll have no problem sharing my screen. Um, and we've refined our presentation, so there'll be a lot more information to share. Oh, great. Oh, well, that's somebody. Who is that? Christine. You see Christine? Yeah. Ah, there she is. All right. Hi, Christine. Hi, yeah. My goodness, everyone's here, huh? Uh, Stephanie and Bill aren't here. Bill aren't here. But everybody else is here. So it's it. And we have a new Jeffrey. Hi. Okay, yeah. so why don't we just get started? Um, just a couple of things I, I want to update you on, and then we can go to Ginger and her presentation and give us time to ask questions of her and everything. Um, there's a couple of expenses that we had, uh, $115.93 to the pollinators to get seeds and stuff for the library, and a couple of, I think, awards that they were giving at their June 
um, big affair at the Westford Distillery. And then the other expense was, this was really wonderful, um, $76.15 for safety cones for the farmer's market, which relieved some of my anxiety because we almost had a back in um, recently at this crazy parking lot. And so what Jackie did is she got some safety cones and then put flags connecting the safety cones. And hopefully those flags will alert people so they're not going to back up like full gear and hit either another car, which would be one thing, but people, which would be terrible. So hopefully that's going to solve the problem. And I, I really respect Jackie. She just like, she's standing there watching everything and keeping tabs on things. And she came to me and said, do you think we could get some safety cones? I said, order them. I don't care how much they cost. And she actually ordered them. Hi, Stephanie. And actually got, got them on sale. So we have five safety scone, cones now for only $76, which is a pretty good deal. So we're all set with that. And hopefully nothing will happen because we've got a really full complement now. And there's a lot more stuff, particularly with the food truck there. The food truck takes up a lot of space. So it's good. I mean, I'm not complaining about that. But it just means that people need to be very careful when they're pulling in and pulling out. And there are people who use the second parking lot. That's great. And there are a lot of people who park along the road, which is also great. But I think we, we're we we're doing pretty well, I think, this year with the market in terms of, of amount of people. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. And I think most of the people at the market are pleased also. So I see Bill. Hi, Bill. And Hello. So, okay. I, so. I, I didn't go um, this last Sunday, but um, bef the Sunday before, um, I had heard that the food truck was going to be over by the other parking lot. Did, did they move last Sunday? Jackie had wanted them to go to the other parking yeah, lot. They might have. I think they might have come up, been up on the grass now that I think about right. it. I just raced down there because I had... Uh, they, they were on the other side of the um, picnic tables. Right. right. That's yeah. what I, I had heard that they were go supposed to be there, but I didn't know if they had good. Yeah, and, and they have a, because there's a full complement right now. Of course, within a couple of weeks, probably um, the food vendor will leave because once she runs out of food, food um, fruit, uh, she'll leave. Uh, but I think most of the other people, they're probably going to be there. So um, it's a good idea to try and be aware that there's a lot of traffic and just go in there slowly and go out slowly which is sometimes hard for people to follow through um so i'm going to just flip down um to the um our, our little talk since ginger's here she's right on time she was early and i i think everybody got the presentation that she's going to give or at least some part of it that she sent to me so that you kind of know a little bit about what this is about. And so I'll just let you go, Ginger, and talk about what your idea is about the Cato Rock property, which we're all interested in. Okay, sounds great. All right, so uh, I'm gonna kinda, kinda keep it loose, but the presentation, just a side note the, that Loretta um, sent to you is the basics. Um, the presentation I'm gonna give today will be a little bit more elaborate. There's a lot more detail we can share. Um, and I'm saying we because Jeff Doyle is on the call with me. Um, he's the president of the Quiet Corner chapter of the New England Mountain Bike Association, also called QC NEMBA. You can give a little wave, Jeff. <laughs> so um, my name is Ginger Jenny. I'm a resident of Ashford. Uh, I've been living in town for about 10 years. Um, I've been involved in various capacities, including I, I was a previous vendor of the Ashford Farmers Market years ago. So. Um, Familiar, familiar with a lot of what the Con Conservation Commission does. I'm a huge supporter of um, sustainability, uh, renewable energy. Um, I have solar panels that offset my power 100%. Um, I'm a big fan of what you guys do. I've been watching you guys on and off for years. So, um, and one big thing is I'm a big fan of public green spaces. So that's a big reason why I'm here to give a presentation about the, um, uh, the, uh, town-owned property, Kayla Rock property, um, where the town is trying to figure out what to do with it and 
we are in the ideation stage of um, putting together um, a plan for the town um, that hopefully we can get the backing and support from as many people as possible in town, including from the Conservation Commission. Um, I have talked with other commissions in town and I've also brought up the idea with the Board of Selectmen. So most of the powers of B in the town are aware of, of the idea. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen now so we can go into the presentation. All right. Let me know if it shows up. Uh, we gotta turn on settings. Hold on. You should just be able if it's open on your screen. You should just be able to share screen. Yeah, it's it's uh later. All right. It's making me go through some. It shouldn't be rig rigmarole for permissions here. Yeah. Let's try this again. There we go. All right. All right. Yeah, okay. I had to reset. <laughs> yeah, I had to reset my settings in here. So, all right. It's a little too big. It's too big. I think smaller. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's. I think that's good now. Well, it's on top of the sidebar. I guess I get rid of my sidebar. Yeah, you might have to adjust your screen a little bit. Okay. Um, the window yeah. size. Yeah. Uh, regardless, I'll still cover all the content that's in each slide. Um, so I'm a member of the uh, Quiet Corner NEMBA group. Um, we represent the Quiet Corner area of Northeast Connecticut. And um, we are a mountain bike or organization. We um, um, support mountain biking and one of the recent initiatives is that we have been seeking out um, town-owned property to collaborate with. We would not buy property. We would be working with towns to um, agree to build trails on the property. Um, so the property we're going to be talking about, of course, is the Candle Rock property. Um, a lot of the information on this slide you guys are more than likely already aware of, but I just want to go over it so we know that we're on the same page. Um, the ownership was recently transferred to the town uh, several years ago due to um, tax evasion from the Kittle Rock Company. Um, we're aware that um, there's been, um, that the size of the property that Ashford owns is a little over 300 acres and that there's a neighboring uh, connected piece of property that's about 40 acres that's on the Willington side. Mm. Um, property itself is mostly forest with uh, a pond that's closer to Route 44, um, has some surrounding wetlands, and there's some streams that crisscross the property that are um, are led from the upper corner where there's higher, higher elevation and drains into the pond. Um, there are several old agricultural fields that are peppered throughout the property, and I want to point out that the screenshot that you see here um, is a small section of the property and that's close to 44 and our proposal is to put this old agricultural field as a trailhead location because it's already a cleared area. Um, there's already a gated access and there's also the um, the turnout that's right across from Howard, Howard Road. This already would be an easily accessible spot to go into the property and start um, building trails off of. Um, there are several stone walls and forest roads that currently crisscross the property, which make the um, forest roads make the property nice, nice and accessible to um, trail building in general. Um, it gives us a good head start. Um, the primary access points are Route 44 and Corosi Road, right next to uh, the Knowlton Cemetery. Um, we do want to make a point that this air, this. This spot is a very high visibility location on Route 44. It's right at the gateway to um, to Ashford. Um, so any sort of signage or traffic for trail use will get um, high exposure and most likely a high amount of traffic and, and attendance. So utilizing a, a fairly large trailhead would be um, preferable. Um, 
<clears throat> we're also aware that there's been a lot of EPA remediation in the past. Um, and I've heard that through the grapevine, it's I've heard both directions that there is some remediation that still may need to be done. Um, and I also learned last year that the town has been seeking grants to offset the cost from the EPA um, and also grants to put together a master plan um, so that they can seek out more grants um, to figure out what they want to do with the property. Um, the last item, um, the public hearing. There was a public hearing last September um, that I had listened to. So where residents threw out their ideas for the property. At the time, it looked like there was a lot of support for using this for passive recreation, um, mostly because it's proximity to the Nipmuc Trail, uh, which is in the upper corner of the Willington property. And there were some other proposals for um, uh, a solar panel array or uh, affordable housing or some sort of industrial development. So I want to make a side note that just based on more recent events that have occurred in the town, um, more specifically the mega warehouse that was going on, I have a, and knowing that the town property will need to go through public hearing from with the town residents, um, just based on that whole experience, I have a very significant feeling that no one will want to see any industrial development on this property. <laughs> um, so I'm, and based on also the support of, uh, of most everybody in the public hearing wanting the property to be used, be used for public use, um, I have a feeling that uh, building a trail system there may be in line with people, what people would be uh, in support of. So next, um, I'm going to have Jeff Doyle jump in now. He's the president of the Quiet Corner NEMBA chapter. He's going to go over um, what the NEMBA organization is about and um, the sort of process that would happen if we built trails on this property. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me on. Uh, as Ginger said, I'm the president of the Quiet Corner chapter of the New England Mountain Bike Association. Um, we're a 501c uh, nonprofit. We have 10,000 members in New England, um, every state excluding Vermont, who has their own organization. Um, one of the things we do is, you know, typical mountain biking stuff. We have fun rides and whatnot, but but our core strength is we do um, a lot of the maintenance in the state parks in our area, um, including trail cleanup uh, when trees fall after storms. The state doesn't have any resources to take care of that stuff. We go out there. Um, and we have kind of a core network of, of volunteers that will go out there and clean up the trails, maintain them. If they're eroding badly, we'll, we'll uh, try to mitigate that and change some things up. Um, and probably the, the reason we're uh, even on this call is we recently did a project uh, for the town of Pomfret. Uh, it was a similar piece of property to yours. I think the, the way they acquired it wasn't quite a, a tax issue, but um, they recently acquired it. They were looking to do something with the property. So they approached us and said, you know, they knew a little bit about our work. And they asked us to collaborate with them and build a trail network. So we, um, we jumped right in and we designed uh, and built a trail network for them that has been extremely successful uh, in the eyes of the town. Uh, we've um, eradicated a lot of the invasive species on the property. We've managed some of the water issues they've had on the property, and we've built uh, some trails and some uh, bridges that connected other town properties to the Airline Trail State Park, which was a big part of their initiative. Uh, and the beauty of it is we did it all at zero cost to the town. It was just our sweat equity, and we, we, uh, we funded the bridges ourselves, and we provided all the tools and the manpower. So um, it really was a great success story. Um, and sort of off the off the page here, but since COVID, there's been a huge initiative on passive recreation, and the towns are uniquely suited for something like that. Most of them, most of the towns are large landowners in their own town. Uh, they they either want to do something with it, but they you know don't want to spend a whole bunch of money, or they know they can't get a whole bunch of money approved by the voters, 
we would come out there and do it for you. We've, we'll get into it a little further on, but some of the uh, methods um, we use for recruiting volunteers are pretty unique. And I think it'd be a huge win for the town, um, you know, front to back. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pomfret. Uh, and I, if anybody wants to interrupt, I, I just talk nonstop anyway. So just yell out, raise your hand or whatever. I'll be glad to slow it down. Um, so they approached us in March of 2021. We walked the property with the first select woman. Uh, we started in May of 2021. And in four months, we built nine uh, miles of trails and added on uh, four or five additional miles over the next um, six months. So with the screen and everything, and I was like, what? You know, it sort of looks like the slides are the same as your presentation PDF that I already read. Um, there's some more that are going to be um, that we have a bunch more. So can they be talked through? Um, no, there's a lot of visuals. Oh, that's OK. I mean, <laughs> we that's got okay. it. I think they, okay. they were trying to take over your computer and screen. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, they they were. Um, there was somebody who hacked into it with their own account. And then there was another account that tried to take over my computer. It was two separate accounts. Oh so, my god! I think we're okay now, though. We'll just try. To... <laughs> all right. Let's well, if it happens again, we all just leave fast, okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I guess we can't. Of course, you want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here we go. Back. Back in the game. All right, I'll go back to where we left off. Um, all right, there we go. All right. Um, so, so and Jeff, I was kind of on in the side, but we mountain bike. Jeff, trails. could I just ask a quick question? Sure. That you contacted Pomfret, right? They contacted us. Oh, they contacted you. Okay. Yes. Okay. We're kind of well known in the area, and the first elect woman is a road cyclist, so okay. she was aware of us, anyways. So. Okay, all right, great, yep. thanks. Um, and and you know, mountain biking sort of a niche sport, uh, but the good thing about mountain biking trails is they're also excellent for bird watchers, runners, cross country skiers, snowshoers, hikers. So we feel like we we do a lot for the other sports as well, even though. Uh, you know, singularly kind of focused on mountain bike trails. And with Cato Rock, that's what we would be building is multi-use trails mm -hmm. for multiple sports. All are welcome. The only people we don't like to see on our trails are anybody with a motorized vehicle. Um, and everybody kind of agrees with us on that. So mm -hmm. they usually so, do some damage. So so that's been my kind of primary question since I read your first um um presentation i think you did to pzc or something um is okay so how easy is it for a hiker just a walker to deal with mountain bikes coming after them it's it's very easy it's we're not you know when you talk about any forest uh, in new england basically you have good lines of sight uh there's a m misconception that these bikes are traveling extremely fast uh they're not you can hear them coming you can see them coming they don't want to. They yeah, don't want to. They're usually going about hiker. about five miles an hour is usually mountain bike speed. Like exactly. Walking is about three miles. What an about e-bikes? <laughs> e-bikes go a lot faster. How would we keep electronic bikes out? Yes. Well, Any that's motor. another that's another subject where there's a misconception problem. So they're limited to top speed, um, but they look and act just like a regular mountain bike. So if you had a a winding trail. They're not going to just turn the throttle. First of all, there is no throttle, but they're not just going to go right to 20 miles an hour and come ripping through that trail at 20 miles an hour. Frankly, they would crash long before they got to the first corner. So it, they're capable of 20 miles an hour, but on a winding uh, standard trail in, you know, in the mountain biking world, they're never at 20 miles an hour. They're averaging the same speed the non-electric bikes are. So, and, and the trails by nature uh, we're not talking about the, the type of e-bikes that you see in the inner cities where it's a throttle assist. They have to pedal it to get there. So if they have an e-bike, they're, they're still pedaling to get up to speed, and the trail limits them to how fast they can travel anyways. 
So aren't they aren't they motorized? And 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 se the second question, the big question for me is, how do you keep motorized vehicles out of there, and how do you enforce that? It's it's tough. We're not in the enforcement business. We don't have any authority, but we you know we put signs prohibiting it. Um, you know, you, you can let the state police know that nobody should be uh, riding dirt bikes out there. We can block off uh, trailheads so that, you know, motorcycles are a little trickier, but a quad can't fit through a gap that's less than three and a half feet. So with a couple of big rocks well placed, they can't get there anyways. But frankly, when they see a lot of hikers and mountain bikers there anyways, they don't want to be there. They're, those guys are all riding in the places where nobody's at usually on prop private property without permission. Um, but the when you develop a piece of property for this purpose, they know they're going to get in trouble if they go through there or get confronted or yelled at. So they typically stay away. Well, we just had an incident of um, uh, motor bike things going through and totally wiping out grass and turf at the park at night. So yep. how do you prevent that? <laughs> It, well, it's the, tough. I mean, I do want to speak to that since Jeff is unaware of um, Ashford Park specifically, but Ashford Park itself is a wide open field. Right. And, and they went through and then just tore up a field. Right. So I wanted, I want, do want to specify, I want to add on to what Jeff is saying is that the trails that are built, um, for example, in Pomfret, they're not very wide. So bringing a motorized vehicle through them, you would, you would just hit a bunch of trees. Um, or in rocks and logs because they're only wide enough for a bicycle or a hiker to go through. Um, and then the nature of the um, the topography in the trails, there's just so many rocks. Like you, would, if you had a motorized vehicle, you would just be beating that machine up to, you would just be beating it up. It would just, and you wouldn't, you barely be moving because the way these trails are built, they're not meant for you to go very fast on them. Okay, I need to see the Pomfret place. How do how how do where is it? How do I get there? <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna show you some pictures of it, and um, and we'll also be able to show you um, the exact location. Okay, good. Thank you. I I have a question too. Um, have you are you have you guys uh, walked the property at all? I um, I have probably not to the extent of Ginger, but um, yeah. I've seen a, a pretty good chunk of it. Okay. Yeah, I've ridden I've ridden my bike through it on the forest roads. Okay. So you know that that there are roads through there that are quite wide. And yes. I'm pretty sure you could get up a pretty good uh up to a pretty good speed on a, on one of those roads if if uh <clears throat> if that was um part of yep. a trail. But it kind of sounds like you guys are designing trails that maybe inhibit speed is that true yeah. or not by nature yes we, we honestly wouldn't be interested in riding on those logging roads oh so okay these are these are winding hiking trails through the forest okay yeah. and and there there is a, a blue trail through the property at, at, as you may be aware yeah nipmuc yep. yeah um the nipmuc trail um i don't believe they allow mountain biking on it no uh, they do not it's a hiking only trail okay so you would be avoiding that uh yes. that trail yep um based on yes. the location of it it's um it cuts through the very upper far corner of the willington right. property so it'd be instead of it cutting right through the middle of the property instead of it being in, since it's on the very far corner it would be very easy to avoid it right a, a a homeowner who happens to be a town employee has asked to uh, have part of that trail relocated a little farther away from his boundary too, but um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, but okay. yeah, okay, and look forward to hearing more. Yeah, yeah, we'll keep moving forward because I have, I have a feeling that the rest of the presentation will, will answer a lot of the questions you've addressed um, in Great. further detail. Okay. And uh, after the presentation, we, we can we definitely have time to answer more questions. Perfect. All right. Now, as far as the, the Pomfret Forest uh, property that we, we just built out, obviously it was a big win for us. We got a new riding area out of it. Um, it's been very popular. The win for the town is Pomfret uh, doesn't have a whole lot of tourism. They've got a small state park there that doesn't get a whole lot of use, frankly. Um, in two years since we've opened the trails there, 
We've recorded over 2,000 rides on one. There are apps, smartphone apps that track your outdoor activity. On one app, we had over uh, 2,000 visits. We've had visitors from 14 states. Uh, it is sort of a go-to uh, area for the CCAP, which is a local um, youth cycling community. We've had fun rides there. Um, the only con that the town can see is that there's literally nowhere in Pomfret to spend money. If you come out there and ride your bike in the morning, there's only one place to get lunch. Uh, there's no gas station. There's, that's their only downside. They haven't had any issues or incidents. Um, and again, the cost to the town was zero. We did all of it for them for nothing. So this is the entrance to the Pomfret Forest. It's on 118 Wolf Den Road. And by the way, if we move forward with you know uh, further interest on this, we'd be happy to meet you out there and you can take a walk. We can show you what we did. I think it's a similar uh, piece of property to the Cato Rock property. Um, this was an existing field that came with the property. We mowed it down immediately, uh, put up a sign, uh, made sure that the local fire departments knew the addresses we plotted uh, evacuation routes in case somebody got hurt out there. Uh, but this parking lot is actually going to get, uh, the entrance is going to get moved a little further down the road. And uh, they're going to, all that low brush you see behind that pickup truck in the distance, all that's, the town's going to mow all of that down, open up the whole area and shift the whole parking lot further down the road so that um, a local farmer can hay the rest of the field. So, but that parking lot, as it sits, probably holds 200 cars, which is a little ambitious. We don't, we don't quite need that big an area, but uh, that's why they're going to try to get the most uh, use out of that field if they can. So, is this the end of Wolf Den that's close to 101? Yes. Yep. It's uh, two addresses down from 101 on the right side. Okay. There's the Gwin, the Gwin, is it just yeah. after the river? Uh, no. You know where the Gwyn Carrigan is? I'm sorry, the what? The Gwyn Carrig Inn. Oh, where the distillery is now. Yes. Yep. Uh, if you take a right on onto Wolf Den Road, you go by, uh, yeah, the, the right side of the distillery. There's two houses, and then there's our parking lot right there. <laughs> probably an eighth of a mile up the road. Yep, this is a typical Sunday morning. Uh, the place has also been extremely popular with families. The nature of the trails that we built, uh, there are some advanced things for advanced riders, but even a family with some small kids, they can, the small kids can go around this tough stuff. Mom and dad can try to go over the tough stuff and, and they don't uh, veer too far away from each other. So um, this, is a, this is just the entrance single track. It's actually a little shaggy looking on the right side because that's where the new parking lot is going to be. So until they come and mow it down, we're leaving it all kind of natural. Um, this kiosk is pretty interesting. We had two Eagle Scouts approach us for projects that they could help with. And one of them built a, an entirely new trail on the other side of the property for us. And this one built uh, the kiosk. And he did such a good job, the town wanted him to build more kiosks for other town properties, but uh, the, we've got a we got a nice grant, so we've got beautiful trail maps. Um, we've got a box for pamphlets uh, about other features in the town, um, and there's a good write up about the town, the property's history, and the town's history. And also some information about Nemba on there too. Yep. <laughs> we always put a blurb about Nemba. Sorry about that. I talk about Nemba so much, I, I glossed over that. All right, this is the sample map. Uh, we've color-coded the trails uh, by difficulty. They're also available on all of the apps, Strava, Trail Forks, and whatnot. Um, the location of the, of the wetlands is there. And uh, there's also some uh, trail names uh, that are kind of tough to see on this, but uh, they're all listed there. So. And they also, um, there's also uh, landmarks, and um, including places to go eat and other um, resources yes. surrounding, the, the surrounding the forest. Yep. We, we listed everything in town that um, we wanted to highlight. So as far as building a brand new from scratch uh, trail network, this is a little bit of, of what's involved. So 
um, we would first and foremost walk probably before anything is take a bunch of walks out there, walk around with a GPS app on the phone, make sure we're not wandering into private property, kind of get a feel for what the layout looks like. The apps have elevation and whatnot. Um, and then we can, by doing a breadcrumb trail of everywhere we walk, we kind of know exactly where all the water is, where any problems are, any place that would require a bridge. Um, once we kind of had a pretty good idea of what's what, we'd start fine tuning it, trying to find what would work for a good trail network. Um, we usually flag it with orange tape and adjust it many, many times before we start raking and digging. Uh, and then once we've got it all kind of laid out, we would invite the public or the town manager, whoever wanted to see what we're planning on doing and walk with us and, and take a look at what we're, we've got in mind. Uh, and then when we start to build, uh, basically we would start the parking area. Once we have that trail network laid out, we'll know exactly where to start and uh, return to the parking lot. Um, and a lot of it is brush cutting. A lot of it is uh, removal of really nasty invasive stuff. Uh, Multiflora rose is everywhere at uh, Pomfret. Uh, lots of um, just lots of nasty stuff. So that's usually what we're cutting through. We don't cut live trees unless it's an invasive or it's somehow damaged to the point where it could be a danger to somebody. It's the only reason we would take it down. So a lot of times when People hear chainsaws, they assume we're just dropping huge trees down. We're, nothing we build is going to be wide enough for a car to drive down. So we, well, I do we wanna, prefer uh, to... I do want to jump in really quick, Jeff, because yep. there was something I forgot to mention. Um, uh, the town is in the process of meeting with Yale Forestry to do an audit of the property. Um, and this is specifically in regard to trees as they, they will go through and they'll, they will see if there's any harvestable trees. Um, on in the Candle Rock property. Um, and if that is the case, if Yale, fortunately Yale Forestry is known for doing uh, things really neatly and, and they're not gonna clear cut any property. So if, the, if Yale Forestry is working on Candle Rock, this wouldn't affect um, this plan that we would have either. It would actually be to our benefit where they would make the forest more sustainable and um, easier to, to navigate through. Well, there mostly during a survey as I understand. So there is a ton of um, olive on Cadle Rock. How do you deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get rid of it. it, it we try. I yeah. mean, we're not going to eradicate every invasive species, but there's a lot of so, stuff out there that's just taking do over. Round, do you use Roundup? No, we don't use chemicals. We we, we, okay. we dig it out. We cut it out. We do whatever we can to get it out of there. Okay, good. Yeah, Pomfret is, it was choked out. In fact, we, we had a few uh, concerned citizens concerned about the, the noise of the gas-powered chainsaws and whatnot. And we found that uh, by, we've even been trimming the canopy with a pole saw by getting sunlight down to the, to the forest floor. Everything beneficial is doing better. And, and some of the weeds and the invasives aren't coming back. So it's really neat. I mean, the the mountain laurel is beautiful at uh, certain times of year at Pomfret Forest. Uh, the, when it's flowering, it's just amazing out there. Uh, but the entire forest is doing better. I'm not a forester, but you can tell, like from when we started, how how bad it was then and how beautiful it is now. It, it's thriving. So, um, so back to the build phase. Uh, once we get it all sketched out, we'd start cleaning trails. Mostly, this involves a weed whacker and a rake. Uh, we'd rough it out, and when we say rough it out, we like to, um, you know, have it weave. This, we don't like straight lines. We like to um, have the trail meander, and we also want to, we don't want a, a big squiggly, you know, spaghetti, you know, map either. So we try to get it, you know, laid out so that um, it makes sense, and we also work with the, the slope so that instead of uh, just, you know, a little trail 101 for years and years and years, every trail went straight up a hill. Well, that turns into a gutter once it's beaten down. Every time it rains, it washes more dirt down the hill, and then it's a rocky mess like you see in some of these state parks. We don't do that. We try to uh, traverse the hill at a slope, 
Uh, we'll bench it if it's a steep enough slope so that it's comfortable to walk or ride a bike on. Um, but we're not talking about building, you know, massive dirt piles or anything like that. It's a very natural looking trail uh, through the forest and it, and it will follow the terrain in a way that makes sense and is sustainable. Um, so when we, it, this uh, trail, this um, slide is a little oversimplified, but the most popular trail network is what they call a stacked oval. Think of a snowman upside down. By the parking lot would be a small loop, usually a beginner loop. It's usually the easiest terrain. If there's a field there anyways, it's probably flat or pretty close to flat. Then the middle terrain would be up a slope or slightly uh, longer and work in some different features. And then the, the top oval, uh, and it could be multiple ovals, but the, the top oval would be the biggest loop. So if somebody wanted to ride three miles, they could just do the bottom. Uh, if they wanted nine miles, they could do the bottom and then hit the middle oval and so forth and so on until you've got the whole property sort of laid out. It never actually looks like ovals on the map because you've got to go around the terrain. Um, but that's the thinking. You want every additional trail on the map to feed back to the parking lot at some point or back to the trail it came off of in the first place. So um, we, we do a lot of fine tuning as we, as we walk the property and start cutting. Um, so um, we would, if we see any stream crossings, uh, we will either put a culvert in and a bridge over it. Sometimes they just require a very simple uh, bridge. Sometimes they require a, an elaborate wooden bridge. Uh, but we've got a lot of experience building wooden bridges too. So uh, we build them very safe. We build them, most of them with handrails, depending on the height. Uh, we build them the code. So, um, and as, again, as we're building all of these trails off of the initial entry trail, uh, we constantly fine tune it. We would have anybody who is interested could come out and walk with us. If, you know, we're, we're very receptive to feedback and ideas as to you know how we can make it better. So these are some photos of some of our volunteers. This is all at Pomfret. Uh, there's uh, if you see the the right hand photo is a benched area. It's a very steep slope that was getting eroded. So they're actually moving rocks uh, to reinforce the downward side of the slope so that when we put the dirt onto it, the dirt uh, becomes a level surface. The rocks hold it up on one side and then uh, forever on, the water will just drain right off of that flat surface. And they're actually, the ones on the left are actually blocking off an old trail that was sort of crisscrossing the property. So uh, this is my favorite tool. That's a mantis tiller. When we have to bench a trail or even uh, fix a slope it's a little gas powered tool that just chews up dirt like you wouldn't believe uh so that's my uh that's my baby right there and on the right hand side is a bridge we just recently built we don't use uh pressure treated for the most part we've been having a lot of success uh with local uh timber from a sawmill in sterling and believe it or not that bridge right there was built on old magnesium or aluminum ladders uh, which are fantastic. They anchor right to the rock. They're super strong for bridges uh, and we're not leaching pressure treated uh, into the ground uh, everywhere. So I put this one in because everybody's like, can't believe that it's zero cost. If the town wants to give us money, they certainly could. Um, so the parking lot area, if the land is suitable, uh, we, we just mow it cars start driving on it the grass never grows back because cars have been driving on it we'll drop some logs so people can't drive off the the, the parked area um but if you um if put it this way if we had a, a parking lot that was needed a little work well the first place we would ask is probably dpw see if dpw will just send a loader down there for the day to push some dirt around and make it a little little less treacherous for cars to drive in and out of the place um, typically, we don't need a whole lot of material for a parking lot, but um, if the drainage or something like that, um, we would usually just get some gravel and, and get some volunteers to spread it out there. So, Jeff, um, uh, Jeff, why do you need a large parking area? 
You, well, you don't necessarily, but I, from experience, from our Pomfret Forest experience, there's days, and Ginger can attest to this, we, there's 30 or 40 cars in the lot at almost every Saturday year round now at Pomfret Forest. And then once or twice a year, we have a fun ride there and you'll get 150 cars. It doesn't have to be big. We certainly wouldn't drop a bunch of trees to make it huge. But if you've got that field and it's good size, it's not a bad idea to have a, a, a pretty good size parking area or at least a middle size one with an overflow parking down the road or something like that. So, Yeah, that's why we um, pointed out that that old agricultural field is it's already clear cut already. There's not going to be any trees growing on it. So it, um, it already will work to our favor to have that as a parking area. Yeah, and I think that's quite a bit bigger than the field at Pomfret. So we probably would section it off so that we're only using what we need rather than just having this big, massive field. Um, you know, we're, we're not talking about large festivals or anything like that. So, um, you know, we would, we would only use what we need or anticipated needing. Um, wooden bridges. Uh, every time we've needed a wooden bridge, we've either paid for it ourselves uh, or gotten donations from local businesses. We do a lot of that solicitation. Uh, but, um, and Ginger is going to remind me of the name of the road um, on the eastern side of Cato Rock. Karosi road. Ro road, yeah. Karosi Road. There is a stream crossing on Karosi Road. That would require a fairly expensive bridge. Um, that would be something if the town wanted access from that side, you know, we'd say, well, what can you do for us? Or, you know, we might pay for ourselves, but that's that's a pretty big bridge. If anybody's familiar with that stream crossing, uh, it's pretty it's pretty high and it's pretty far. So that might that might require some engineering or whatnot. So yeah, par parking parking would be an issue there too. Yeah, we I don't think we'd want to park there, but if you wanted it for some other access, uh, you know, we'd, we'd help you build the bridge and we'd probably help you pay for it, but that would be an expensive bridge. The only thing I can think of so far uh, that the town would even might want to concern themselves with, but, um, and then as far as kiosks and signage, yeah, we will pay for what we could. Town wants to help, that's fine, but we were pleasantly surprised in Pomfret that either local businesses or uh, the Eagle Scouts all kicked in uh, and basically didn't cost us uh, anything. So we have all of these things at Pomfret, uh, kiosk signage and a bicycle repair stand. The bicycle repair stand was $2,000. We wrote a grant for part of it and two local businesses wrote a check for the balance. So. Uh, these are just some of the features of multi-use trails. So we, when I say mineral removal, we're not looking to come in with a bulldozer and reshape the land to suit us. We use the existing terrain uh, and features that are there, natural features that are there. Uh, we control the erosion uh, on these trails. We want them to last a long time for selfish reasons. Uh, if they're not built correctly, we have to spend a lot more time maintaining them and not riding, uh, but it is also the right thing to do. And we try to stay as far away from wetlands as possible. Uh, again, these aren't motorized vehicles, so oil and fuel spills aren't an issue, but it also doesn't make sense to ride your, your mountain bike through a, a low-lying area that's wet half the year. Uh, nobody wants to do it. We don't want to do it. So, um, And they are specific for non-motorized use. They're, they're tight, narrow. We talked about that Um uh, let's see. So if any, uh, for what we call features, the fun stuff that we like to ride, it's 99% of the time, it's a down tree. A down tree is no use to anyone, um, but we'll chainsaw the top of it flat and ride our bikes down. It's called the skinny. It's kind of fun and challenging. Uh, it's laying next to the trail anyway, so it's an easy win for us. Uh, big rocks we love riding over. Um, and just any um, topographical feature that would be fun to ride up and down is what we typically use. So um, just like Pomfret, uh, all the trails would have varying levels of difficulty. So uh, Ginger's son is a fairly new rider. She could ride every trail and he, you know, he might stay off the tricky stuff and she might go right over it. But they're both on the same trail having fun. 
Um, and we see that everywhere at Pomford. Every every nice day is full of families riding out there and having fun. Um, very much like Pomfret, uh, socialization and groups gathering together. Cato Rock is very suitable for this. It's big visibility. It's right on Route 44. It's easy to get to. And you're not, um, you, you would, the, both both properties are small enough, unlike Patchogue State Forest, where you could go out there all day and never see another rider. But there might be 40 of them out there. You, the place is so big, you just don't run into each other. Uh, this is, these are smaller areas, purpose built. You would see like-minded individuals almost every time you went out there, I guarantee it. So, um, and then this, the maintenance would all be handled by trail users and trail builders. We found this with Pomford as well. We, we get the local riders excited about the place and people we didn't think had any interest in helping us do trail maintenance have been putting in hundreds of hours, uh, making sure the place is well cared for and uh and and just in tip-top shape all the time so um, would, you, would you put okay. in places for um walkers to go to the side and maybe sit we could we've we've got a couple of natural benches uh big flat rocks that we ran the trail by at palm frit could certainly build benches or bring benches in uh we could absolutely do that and and the the, the ponds are natural for that. So we get the trail. You want the trail to be close enough to the pond that you go, hey, there's a pond there. Um, but keep it far enough away and maybe clear a nice area. Put a bench or two there. People would love to hike out there and, and sit. So, I guess looking at the size of your trails, they're really narrow trails. And that's pretty cool. But I, I can't imagine... If I'm walking and a bike's coming behind me, how do I get away? <laughs> they're they, they're um, they're not penned in at uh, below shoulder level, so the you, you just step off the trail. So you, it's not like um, it's knee high brush just on either side of your tires. So you know either the cyclist, most likely the cyclist would veer off the trail and let you by. By nature, uh, hikers have the right of way, and every biker knows it. Every once in a while, you might get somebody who forgot the rule, but for the most part, that hiker is going to stop and let you by 99% of the time because right. they're just trained to do it. So we're, both going, we're both going in the same direction. Same thing. <laughs> they, they, would call, they would call out and say, you know, uh, they, they try not to startle you, first of all, but um, yeah, they would... They would yeah, uh, defer. It's definitely, to yeah. Uh, my experience with running into hikers in the on the trails, um, we're not going fast enough that um, we surprise them. Um, and every single time, there's just communication on the trail. So it's uh, it's it's so quiet out. It's so quiet in the forest that you can definitely hear something out there, particularly bikes. And there's definitely, I can attest to what what. Jeff is saying like um, the the trail width there's definitely room on either side for people to move off the trails very easily um, it's just if somebody was bringing a, a wide vehicle like a, a dirt bike or a quad or something just because there isn't there's alternating trees that are close to the trail that affect the width um, it, it won't affect bikers and hikers but it would affect some a larger vehicle going down the trail. Okay. Right. Yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about getting hit by a quad because they wouldn't get out there anyways. So they couldn't fit. Um, and it, by the way, it's not in the best, in a biker's, a cyclist's best interest to startle you anyways. You'll either jump out in front of them, jump the wrong way into their path. They, they don't want it. Trust me. There's a rare bad apple, but 99% of them are going to be so friendly, you won't believe it. So uh, they don't, they definitely do not want a bad interaction with you. We also are all sensitive to the fact that riding these properties are, is a privilege that can be revoked for bad behavior. So it, it does sound, from what you're saying, very different from the rail trails in our area, the wide, <laughs> flat rail trails. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, those are well those are old train tracks and and there's runners, there's cyclists, uh grab what they call gravel riders, which is like a road bike. Some of those guys are up in the high teens 
and they're hauling, but it's also wide enough that they can go around a hiker or a jogger or whatever. Um, actually, the Pomfret property crosses the airline trail because half the property is on, on the west side of it and the other half's on the east side of it. So, Yeah, the, um, air, but, the airline trail runs right down the middle of Pomfret Forest. So right. mountain bikers are actually crossing air, the airline trail and we have to watch for traffic uh, runners and, and bikers that are on the airline trail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and that's the other thing is if you have other user groups in town uh, that, you know, once we get Cato Rock cleaned up and trail and and, and sign, signage and whatnot, you'll see groups of runners and stuff like that are out there in the winter, snowshoers and cross country skiers. It's it's very much a community and, and we are very inclusive as far as that stuff goes. There is a um, blurb on this slide about adaptive uh, cyclists, and that's kind of a big push right now. Uh, so uh, basically, um, the, the process of getting an adaptive trail, it has to be a certain width for, or, um, uh, it, they call them AMTBs, it's an adaptive mountain bike. So uh, a wheelchair, for lack of a better term. But um, something like that, In if you, you your location is probably ideal for some trails like that, because you would draw all of that community from lower New England to come there because there's so few places that have those adaptive trails yet. So, and you could get tons of grant money and all that stuff lined up for that too. And and the non-adaptive mountain bikers and the adaptive mountain bikers get along fantastically. So um, that's something else to consider. So it, it kind of sounds like, um... Your proposal essentially wants to take over most of the property. Is that true? It, we we would want to touch every corner of it, but it again, we wouldn't be spider webbing trails on every you know five feet of the place. Depending on the terrain, if we can get ten to fifteen miles of trails out there, and the nature of a forest is the trails can be one hundred and fifty yards apart, and you won't know the other trails there. So. We would use the entire uh, terrain, the entire map, if possible, if allowed. And but you could also use other sections for certain things. Uh, Pomfret Forest has a disc golf course on one piece of the property, and our mountain bike trails weave around it um, and through the center of it, not through the course itself. But there's holes on either side of our trail, and we get along fine. We actually maintain their disc golf course for them now, so. Um, we've got, um, we've got a multi-use trail that bisects the entire property east to west that is, uh, equine, um, friendly, running friendly. We have the tackle the trail running race comes through the property every year. We clean the trail for them and market for them. Um, we've got, we just, we're not going to cover the entire property with mountain bike stuff, but to get the kind of miles to make it worthy as a destination for a mountain biker, you've got to kind of use as much of the map as you can. That doesn't mean you can't leave a, a swath open for something else, but depending on the property. And, and this could be part of the layout plan as well. If you think you want to leave a, a section for, um, you know, a, a disc golf course or something like that, just say stay away from that and we'll put the trail right around it. I'm, I'm just trying to get a picture of the use and pretty much what, from what you've said, like in Pomfret, it's extremely popular, like uh, 50 cars on the weekend. So um, and, uh, That's a big day, but yeah, I mean, on any given day, there's five or six cars in the parking lot. People at work uh, or, or have the day off, they might come by at noon. Typically, though, it's not 50 cars at once. On any given Saturday, you, there's probably 50 cars the whole day. The early risers are out there at 6 a.m. and they're out by 8. Then the 8 o'clock, the 9 o'clock. And then some people come after work. and They are at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. So, um, But it's a steady flow of traffic at, coming into your town. It sort of sounded like you hold events periodically, too. Yep, and that's optional. We obviously get permission from the town to do that. Uh, we have our fun rides at it. They're a big draw. The town has no problem with it, uh, but it, you know we're we're certainly uh, receptive if you if it's something you had an issue with. 
keep in mind, it brings people from uh, these fun rides are uh, promoted by all of NEMBA, the New England chapter. All 10,000 members get notifications for it. So you're going to get visitors to your town that might have never come through Ashford. So, um, and it's one day. They, we clean up after them. Uh, they usually clean up after themselves anyways. Uh, they typically hang out for a food truck after. They usually in and out of the town in three or four hours uh, and hopefully spend some money on the way in or out. What about, um, I, I may be jumping ahead, but liability, uh, what's liability to the town? I mean, people get hurt on mountain bikes, so. They do. I'm not an expert and I can get, I can certainly put, uh, get more info from the town of Pomfret, but the town of Pomfret had the same concern. They brought their insurance uh, underwriter out to the property and they didn't have any problem with any of it. And, and Pomfret's got some pretty, some pretty uh, tough terrain, uh, some pretty challenging stuff for mountain bikers. The insurance uh, uh, person had no issue with any of it. His only advice was don't put a sign up saying ride at your own risk. Uh, I'm not an insurance expert, but if you put that up, you're acknowledging that there is risk. If you don't put it up, all towns and states are protected from people using their property for recreation. That's the way it was explained to me. Weird. So you're got there's a uh, there's a fair concern in the town uh, that there be some kind of economic development on that property. Um, are you going to be able to leave some space for maybe somebody to build something on the edge or something? <laughs> and that's going to come up. Yeah. First of all, it's not up to us. And, and let me be perfectly clear on this. If you guys say you guys can build some trails here, we'd like to see it, uh, Moo, a, me a memo of understanding saying, if you guys build trails, we'll, we'll guarantee you can have them for five years to ride on or something like that. There's no way a legal, legal binding thing. It's just more of a handshake deal. We'll build the trails. Frankly, if we finish the trails and you say, we decide to go in a different direction, we'll go, well, that stinks, but you know it is what it is so this is kind of a good faith thing we're not developing the property we have no claim to it uh and you know if you were going to put a small retail or something like that on the front of the property we would say well all right let's move our parking lot over here and see if we can work something out like that we we by no means do we have any claim to your property if we do this it's just a volunteer project uh it's still your property to do with as you see fit yeah, I'm just saying that that is a concern in town, and you might want to um, kind of hit that up front in your presentations and say maybe this area could be some retail area or something. You yeah, know, I think <clears throat> just to, to hold off, we're going to, there's more of the presentation that will address that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm looking at this slide for economic development, but that's not necessarily on the property. No, no, there's uh there's more slides. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from Sterling. Uh obviously I know a lot about Pomfret. Ashford's probably a megapolis compared to both of those towns as far as businesses go. But every small town I talk to, they're trying to draw in restaurants, uh, small retail. Nobody wants uh another Walmart. Uh but um, and everybody wants a brewery lately because that draws in all kinds of people to your town. So um, mountain bikers, I think, are pretty uh, pretty good uh, guests of your town. They don't cause trouble. They don't stay late. They don't party too much. The most you'll ever get is they'll go riding and then they'll, they'll go grab lunch somewhere and grab a beer and then go home. So they, they, they usually typically have a lot of money to throw around. Yeah, and and they yeah, they've got some pretty good demographics. So they're very strong uh financials. Uh the bikes are expensive. Uh they're typically professionals, and it's the easiest visitor you'll have. They're gonna spend some money right after they ride and get a burger somewhere, and it should be in your town. Or if there's a brewery, they're gonna stop and have a beer after their ride and then get home and get back with their family or wash the mud off their bike. So uh, it's kind of an ideal guest, in in my opinion, and it's definitely a biased opinion. But we see that in some of the case studies of what mountain biking does for a town. So, 
Yeah, right. so I'll, I'll jump in since um, I know Ashford has a lot of concerns about e economic development, and that's what we'll talk about a little bit, just a little bit in the next few slides. Um, just a little background. I know Jeff as well, but myself, I've traveled all over the country going to um, trail mountain bike trail systems, west coast, east coast, south, north. I've seen what um, trail systems can do for towns. I see how they support small towns and how um, they can bring in such a massive amount of economic development. Um, not immediately, it's it's like a slow burn. Um, the longer the trails exist, the um, the more um, the more is the more stuff is brought into town that benefits the whole community. Um, you see healthier healthier communities, healthier families. It brings in higher um, uh, higher property values. Um, it brings in a lot more small town feel. Like uh, not, it doesn't bring in chain stores. It doesn't bring in. Um, any of uh, the the uh, uh, the stuff that people would prefer not to have, I guess, like mega warehouses or WalMarts or whatnot. No, um, so, uh, um, uh, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, with something that would be built in the town, there there is the possibility of um, uh, long term economic development. This isn't something that will be short term, like just use the property once and it goes away or, or, or um, there's trail systems all over the country that have been there for decades and they have no shortage of visitors um, for, for that amount of time. Um, I actually was speaking with um, uh, Mrs. Silversmith, uh, the first, the selectman, um, and we were bouncing ideas off of each other and we had the idea of having like a trail side welcome center um, I know this was an idea that Loretta had actually brought up, like having a nature center on site, something, uh, a small building, or it could be a small building, it could be a large building um, that could have uh, nature and trail info. It could act as a retail spot uh, for food and drink. It can be manned at um, peak uh, trail use time evenings. Um, it could act as a rental facility where people could rent bikes, they could rent snowshoes, um, they could rent any sort of sporting equipment to use on the property um, that would be ongoing um, uh, income for the property. Uh, it could actually it could act as an outdoor gathering spot to encourage more visitors to stop since it's along Route 44. Um, any sort of building that is right along that spot would certainly draw more people um and to utilize the trails or just stop and hang out um you can also fundraise with seasonal multi-sport organized trail races and group events this is what nemba does already um they um and other trail systems in the area take advantage of the trail races like organizers will come in um and take advantage of the trails to um uh, bring more people to the area um I was talking with Sherry York, who's in the, uh, the Park and Rec Commission and the Park and Rec, Park and Rec Director for Ashford. Um, she currently runs a bicycle skills camp every summer for kids. And this past summer, they had record attendance for the bicycle camp. They had over 25 or 30 kids when in the past, they've only had like um, five or six kids sign up. So there's a genuine interest for more kids to get on bikes in the area and building a trail system like this would give kids something to do, some place to go, some place to spend time with their families. And it could also be an opportunity for um, Ashford Park and Rec to host their skills camps there in the summertime. Um, we have the Webster, uh, we have the Webster Scout Camp in town. Oh great, are we getting hacked again? I, I like all the bikes. Uh, okay, let's close. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> uh, stop share. Right. It's really nice to meet you guys and gals. I'm watching Monday Night Walk. Is whistling. Congratulations on your future savings. What's important to know? Family and saving money. Right? And 
not necessarily in that order. More lines mean more savings with Straight Talk. Just $25 a line for unlimited data all on nationwide. Someone have their radio on? Oh, we, we're still being hacked. Oh, okay. We're still being hacked. <laughs> it's fine. I play soccer this Saturday. My birthday is September 9th. I'm counting 40. I like Damien. I like Karen Owen. And I like Finn Balor. Oh my gosh. It's fine. Ginger, if you could just close your uh, screen share. Yep, it's already, it is closed. Yep. Okay. Could you please uh, leave this meeting? Hi, Manu. Can you can you can you leave? Okay. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. <laughs> oh, I think I think you can uh, probably mute them too. Hide, hide non-video picture. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Still there. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they're not talking. Uh, I, you can hide them, actually. Um, all right. Let me see. Uh, as long as they're not talking. All right, back we go. Everybody good? Yep. Yeah, I think you need to go faster. <laughs> okay, just so we don't get caught again. So yeah, I'm trying, I usually, I'm a fast talker, so hopefully I was going okay. <laughs> um, so we left off with the Webster Scout Camp. Um, that would be it, as uh, we, Jeff mentioned uh, with Pomfret, we did a lot of collaboration with the Boy Scout Camp. Um, and I know at the Webster Scout Camp in Ashford, um, they do have a mountain biking, this is, this is a photo of their mountain biking bike shop. Um, so I know they're a big supporter of bicycling. Nord Yakulev, who's photo pictured here, is a big supporter of mountain biking, so I have a feeling that we can collaborate with them. Um, also, because of our proximity with Pomfret, we could cross-promote our trail systems with each other. It'll... <clears throat> It'll allow visitors to linger longer in the area by utilizing both trail systems um, where they can make like a weekend of it rather than just a few hours where they can visit both trail systems. Um, I do want to make a point that a lot of towns surrounding Ashford also have mountain biking systems. Tolland, Mansfield Hollow, um, Man uh, Tolland has Crandall Park, uh, Mansfield has Mansfield Hollow, um, there's uh, trails in Coventry um, and, of course, Pomfret. Um, those are just a few of the towns that are surrounding that have mountain bike trails. There are no mountain bike trails in Ashford, um, but there's no shortage of hiking trails that are utilized. I know you guys did a lot of work with Langhammer property, um, and I ride my bike by that a lot, <laughs> and I see the, the trailhead. So I know that you guys are really um you do a lot of good work with uh trail systems in town so this would be just something a little different that would draw people to town um this last slide um this and i i'm not going to open these up but these links were included in the uh presentation that was shared with, with all of you um i do invite you to take an opportunity to click through on these links um you can link through them directly through the pdf um they're all um 
Additional case studies from how mountain bike trails have benefited small towns um, elsewhere in the country. Um, and it gives a lot of overview of how it supported towns economically, as well as like um, just bringing in more tourism. So um, I think that's pretty much it for now. Um, so if there's any additional questions, I know this is just scratching the surface, but um, I'm gonna stop sharing now, <laughs> just in case we get hacked again. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. Um, does anyone have any additional questions um, or concerns? <clears throat> I just, uh, I just want to, I didn't ask any questions because other people asked them, but um, I think it's a great idea and it's such a beautiful piece of property. I would hate to see it um, destroyed. I think we need to be able to use it and get out there. Um, I, I do think the selectmen, and as uh, Christine said, many people in town want some kind of economic development and um I had thought perhaps a strip along 44 might work. Um, if you have all these people come in, maybe somebody would want to open, you know, a, a restaurant, um, especially if Midway never gets reopened. Um, so I, I think, I think there could be possibilities if if we get a lot of traffic in there. I think. Um, I think the town needs to really look closely at the uh, geology there i mentioned this in our presentation there is a lot of wetlands on that property and uh even the field uh that you mentioned potentially using as a parking lot that gets wet on the right hand side uh at certain times of the year um uh you know, it's hard to avoid the wetlands too. They're spread out all over the place. And uh, they're streams. And I think like Ginger mentioned, you know, it, essentially a flow from the Willington side down to the, the pond. Uh, I forget the name of the pond, but Glory. the bigger one there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sounds like a, a pretty big project. Um, I I too think it's a beautiful property. Um, um, I would be a little concerned about large events on a regular basis, uh, or, or even you know whatever. So I, I guess my vision for the property is a little more passive, but um, you know. I'm not the one that's going to decide. So um, um, uh, that's why I inquired about, you know, how much of the property you're considering. I think the neighbors uh, might have some concerns too. I, I don't know how you address that, especially the Carosi Road neighborhood. And I, I didn't hike a whole bunch of that area on the Carosi Road side. So I just, uh, Ginger told me that there was another way into the property. So I parked over there, saw the place where there's definitely a bridge needed. Um, and then I drove around to the 44 entrance. So um, we, we wouldn't be talking about putting cars over there. The trail, if a trail goes anywhere near that road, it probably wouldn't even be uh, visible from their road. So um, I'd be surprised if they had any big objections. So, yeah, the the roads naturally go in that toward Hiroshi. You know, I mean, there's a whole right. road system that ends up there. Are these one-way trails so that bicyclists don't run into each other? Uh, it's it's not an issue. They're all multi. Well, unless specifically designed otherwise, they're typically multi-direction. Um, you, you're, you're talking about two bikes going five miles an hour and you can see something, you know, 50 yards ahead of you. I've never heard of a bike on bike collision unless they both decided to turn the same direction. Uh, they thought they were going to pass each other and one swerved left and the other one swerved left. So I'm thinking yeah. it's a curve, if it's a sharp curve and you can't yeah. see someone coming. 
Yeah, we we would have the the sight lines cleaned up just by nature of how we build the trail. You you really it it would be a really rare circumstance that there was a section of trail where at five miles an hour you couldn't see fifty feet down it. So I encourage everybody to go and look at the Pomfret um, trail. That might answer a lot of your questions in terms of what they're talking about and give you a little better sense of what goes on. And I mean, it could be a part of the whole package deal that I think we have been very clear as a conservation commission that we would really prefer that it basically be a conservation area. And if around the edge, as Janet said, there could be a little economic development. Okay, if that could happen, but Ashford has a history of not having a lot of um, economic development happen. I mean, small businesses are not running to Ashford, even though 44, we know how much traffic 44 gets. So you would think, and particularly now, since there's no restaurant except very limited hours of Wooden Spoon, you would think that people would run, and they haven't. Um, what ran instead was Dollar General. So, you know, we have that, and we also have, as Steve has pointed out several times, and Steve knows the property very well, the amount of wetlands in that property um, limits a lot of use. And hopefully we can get a little bit more information about as the mountain bike people look more and more at this property and come up with their ideas, it, there can be more of a back and forth. But to me, it sounds like a great idea to work with conservation and other uh, groups within the town to think about, okay, this is a great use of this property to a certain extent. And, and really, probably a limited extent in terms of if you look the total property has a lot of wetlands and it has also a lot of steep slopes and stuff so um yeah you have to really be mindful when you're planning um what you're going to do but i think that having um a, tr a trail system there would really help the town there's a lot of interest with with bicycles in town you know, the kids, yeah, the camp is thriving and has, th you know, the bicycle camp every summer, and it seems like it's attracting more and more people. There are a whole group of people who petitioned the school so that some of the kids could ride their bikes to school. Um, so, yes, there there's a big interest in biking in our town. So that's really good. And I think it fits in with some of our purposes. And I don't think anybody is ever thinking of motorized vehicles there. So, I mean, I think we're all in agreement with that, but I really appreciate all the work you did in looking at this and talking to us about this. And, you know, I hope we can keep the channels open as we move through this and have more and more. And it's, well, it also sounds like you've talked to a lot of people in town. So I think you were at planning and zoning, right? Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I've, I've talked to I've talked to planning and zoning at, um just to Jeff Jeff Silversmith though. Yeah. But you did a presentation at Board of Selectmen too, right? I've I've shared the I've shared the presentation with the Board of Selectmen, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that there are a lot of people in town who know and um share also involving Sherry York and everything who's a big rec person and um has done a lot in town. So I'm sure she's an advocate for stuff like this and I, I think the town basically, well, the town, a lot of people have a lot of big ideas for mm -hmm. this property. The problem is the property doesn't fit in with the big ideas and the plan. So it's going to keep getting, in my mind, it's going to keep getting pared down, pared down as the reality sinks in, pardon the pun, with wetlands. <laughs> but I think we're going to have to be a little bit more oh, this is 300 acres that we can do everything with because I don't think that's a reality for this property. But mm -hmm. I think ideas like yours and everything can really enhance this. And, you know, I was at um, Audubon this past weekend and looking at that building, I was thinking, wow, something like that, some sort of educational center could really work there and you know, have a lot of information. And we've talked about having gardens there and, you know, doing programming and having kids 
go there and learn about things. So that's the direction I think all of us in conservation are going in. And I, I don't see that there's a conflict with what you're suggesting. So hopefully um, this can just end up being a better presentation about what we think would suit the property the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of, of the little, the bike shop and like renting out snowshoes and definitely food because people will be hungry when they get off the trail. And I would, would love it if there was a year round place because like we have Ashford Dairy Bar that closes. We want these places that close. We need something. And this would bring the people that could be a great multi-use, a building where Wagon Shed was which is, you know, and then so the parking lot could be big for the bicyclers, but also for this, this restaurant, um, this informational station, and then maybe rental of outdoor equipment. Mm -hmm. So Loretta mentioned that things just keep kind of maybe being pared down as we understand how much of the area is wetlands, as Steve knows really, really well, because he's tromped all over that land. My concern is that there are so many wetlands that you might have to pare down your trails too much to make it worthwhile for you. For example, I don't think anyone wants to have a the kind of muddy sinkhole trail that you find quite often in state forests um, that go through wetlands. Um, and I, I certainly don't think mountain bikers want to ride through that kind of thing. So you might no. be strained than you think you are at the time at, at now. yeah and, and the first thing i'll say is you know long before this gets too involved anyways with everybody's permission i'll start walking the property and kind of laying out what i think we can do uh and get a feel for it and typically you know you want to do it a couple of days after we get a deluge which lately happens once a week anyways so i can kind of get a feel for where the, the wetlands are uh where the wet pieces are um, and find out if it's viable because frankly until I walk every square foot of it don't know what we can do out there but I right. will say that Pomfret is only 240 acres and 30 percent of it was wet we we avoided all of it uh, we had to cross the stream twice we built a bridge it got us into areas where you know you would think based on where you're standing that everything in your line of sight was wet but once you cross over one small section turned out it wasn't nearly that bad. So, um, and the other thing too, is as we built the trail the first year, we started in May, we got through, you know, the winter, we're like, wow, this is really holding up well. It's all dry. Spring thaw came around and one of our trails was underwater. So we scratched it out, moved it up the slope a little bit further and haven't had a problem since. So a lot of it's sort of a, a give and take, but before we get too far down the path yeah i would want to walk the whole property and kind of get a feel for what we could do out there ginger seems pretty familiar with it she seems confident that we can we can find plenty to do out there so and we'd also have a breadcrumb trail to show you on the map like this is where we think the trails will go so yeah absolutely we'll do our due diligence we wouldn't start blazing trails until like and then walk into a wetland and be like oh we got to turn around <laughs> um <laughs> Pomfret does have a lot of wetlands, I can attest to that, and there's a, a big pond right there, and there's some areas where you're, they've obviously avoided it, and then other spots where you're like, all right, we're 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 up high, you can see it way down low, we're in a safe zone, even if it's a skinny little strip of land, we're able to take advantage of that. Um, the the drainage and the erosion control at, at Pomfret is amazing. Um, I mean, all of these concerns that you guys have brought up, I've, I've run into them. I've run into hikers. I've run into other bicycles on the trail going the opposite direction. Um, I've you never ridden at them. I've never run into like somebody like physically, <laughs> like, like I've, I've, I, when I, I mean, I've passed hikers, I've passed <laughs> other bicyclists. Um, everyone is great at communicating. Um, and, uh, I've never run into any motorized, um, a vehicle like any dirt bikes any quads i ride there i ride a pomfret all the time and one thing i can say cons consistently is every time i've gone there's tons of happy people uh there's always somebody who's talking to me saying this is my first time here where do i go it happens every single time because the trail system has gotten so popular um 
in I've been a mountain bike mountain biker for 20 years or so. Um, I've ridden trail systems all over the country, as I mentioned. Um, and I've never been more proud to have a place like Pomfret in my backyard with the trail system that Nemba has built. I have been thrilled with what they have done. Um, so I would love more than anything to have a place like that in Ashford too. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't do this otherwise because I am, I love sustainability. I love like passive recreation. I love green spaces and I want to, I would never let anything bad happen to Ashford. It's like, I love this town. I want something really good to happen in this town. <laughs> uh, we appreciate that. Oh. Ginger. I know that that's true. Um, <laughs> The other thing I would caution you about, because I think other people have run into a little difficulty, that it is town property. Yep. And you might want to check with the selectmen before you walk on the property so they don't have it reported to them that someone is walking on the property. Um, and if they know, you know, Jeff, if he know, oh, that's Jeff and he's part of the Mountain Bike Association, blah, 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 and Indian, whatever. I think that would bode quite well for you. I don't want you to start out with, uh, you know, kind of the authority feeling like you're not paying attention. So, Absolutely. you know, yep. that's always just a thing to do. Oh. And and I think Bill would be fine with it. Just he like, just to get, let him know, this is what I'd like to do. This is what we just want to get a little bit more clearer lay of the land, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think because if if you are walking on that property, someone will see you, even right. though it, that's my bet. You know, this is <laughs> Ashford. So that's my bet. You and know? it's no trespassing. So it'd be not good for you to be arrested for trespassing. No, I would understand. <laughs> I actually no. have a placard that I put in my windshield that Pomfret. I'd make one up here saying walking with permission or doing trail work with permission of the town. Uh, please contact me at this number for details or whatever. So, okay, yeah, I understand. <laughs> there used to be no trespassing signs up there. They're, they're gone? No. I don't know why they're not up, but there are no no trespassing signs there now. No keep out signs? I haven't seen any. Wow. They were, they were very visible at one point. So where'd you put them, Steve? Uh, I didn't put them... <laughs> I never fess up to that. No, I think Deep <laughs> took them all down when they were <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the feds and Deep when they were doing their remediation. Right. They didn't remember to put them back. <laughs> okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, really, I thank the both of you for giving us a really extensive background about what you have in mind and what you want to do and um if there's other things at some point that we can do, please let us know um, yeah. or yeah. keep us informed if there's something that we can maybe help you with or something or other. And we'll see what happens as we go along, because I think this is a long term kind of project. And I know that um, the grant that was last put in got rejected and mostly it got rejected, we think, because there wasn't any hands uh, uh, ready project on it there was just this we could do this and we could do this and we could do that and the projects that got funded said okay this is what we're doing and we're doing it here and we're doing it and we've got the funding and everything like this or we got partial funding and we need funding for this and all that so I think the next time the grant gets written it needs to be richer in terms of what we're going to do so that's from what I understand that's what Bill and Chris are thinking about for their next, whenever the next one comes. Um, and we want to be able to have input from Yale Forest before we do that, which should give us a lot of information about the land. <clears throat> yep. All of what you mentioned is what I'm, what uh, my understanding as well from talking to uh, Mrs. Mill Silversmith. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. All right. So you two can stay if you want, or you can leave whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And we have just a couple more thank things to, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you thank for you. your time. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we work together in the future. Yeah, right. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I hope so. Okay. Nice to meet you all. All right. Bye bye. Um, the the one major, well, there's actually two things, but 
one big thing that is going to be happening soon, so I wanted to mention it, um, Senior Housing does these talks on, uh, I think it's Tuesday mornings on various things. And so they're interested in hearing about what we do on conservation. And so it probably would be, could be as much as about 45 minutes long, um, but that would be with time for questions and stuff. And that's scheduled for September 12th at, well, 10 a.m., but I think someone's going to talk a little bit about what's going on at the Senior Center. So it'll probably be 10, 15 to 11. So if anyone has any interest in joining me, I would love to have one or two people join me. Um, so, and it's open-ended about, we can talk about whatever um, we're interested in, whatever we're doing. So that's happening. And then the other thing is that um, the big thing is uh, the POCD and um, Christine and I talked to Jeff Silversmith about, well, we had, I had gone uh, a couple of months ago to a planning and zoning and said, we need to have another survey. That was after we talked about it. I think it might've been at our June uh, CC meeting. And it suggested that it would be a really good idea for them to do a survey. So we went um, to Jeff and we said, well, conservation would be willing to start it off and come up with some questions and then give it to planning and zoning and you and Mike D'Amato, who I think is the one going to spear up um, the POCD, well, his company anyway. Um, so, and Jeff was fine with that and welcomed our support and welcomed our interest and everything. So the last meeting of um, the uh keep ashford rural car group came up with some questions that was was that what you sent me or was it in the minutes i, I, I just i just sent that around just before our meet just before tonight it was in the okay, so in everybody the, has that yeah but i just sent it to everybody just before this meeting okay good so what you can do for next time is really take a look at that and see what you might want to add to, change around, whatever. So our next meeting, we can probably spend a lot of time talking about that so that we can get that over. Because the sooner we get that over and they work it out and they can begin starting on it, we don't have to end up rush, 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 which was the last POCD. I mean, I think this is a really important POCD and everybody needs to put in their input um, and there are various ways we can do it. And this survey is one way that we can start out from the very beginning of reaching out to people and saying, you know, what's your take on what's going on? Particularly after people, because of all this warehouse stuff, I think a lot more people are aware in town than they were in 2015. I think also in 2005, which was, I think, a very fine POCD, there were a lot of different people involved um, who really looked at the whole lay of the land of Ashford and what we wanted. And, you know, people who aren't didn't necessarily stay involved, but had certain sets that they were interested in. Um, and I know, Steve, you worked on some of that, too, back in 2005, right? I did. Yeah. And so... It was a rich document. It was more like a grassroots, homegrown thing. I think the next PLCD, it, it had to be done quickly. We had gotten an extension, but um, there was not nearly the amount of people. It just had to be done. And so it was done. And I think it took, rather than the balance in Ashford of economic and um, rural character stuff, it was more a little bit pushed towards economic. So what we want to do, I think, is look at how do we get back to more of that balance and so we don't have to deal with this mega warehouse again um, or anything like that, but that if we, the industry that we have is way more suitable. So that's um, your homework, if you will, for all that. And does anyone have any questions off the top of their head? Um yeah. Did, uh, did those, uh, Christine, did did those ideas you sent us come from Keep Ashford Rural Group? I, I, yeah. I understand. Yes. Yeah. I was at our last meeting last Monday. Okay. So we, we brainstormed. But the thing to remember is that, so if you look back at the original 2005 survey, 
it covers a lot of ground because it's not only economic development, it's also housing and um, dot, 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 dot. I mean, a whole bunch of other areas. So to, to concentrate um, on the conservation issues, it's going to have to be only, not very many questions, I think. Um, otherwise, the survey is going to be a million miles too long, and then that's really counterproductive. So, well, well, go ahead, Steve. I was going to say, um, I just took a quick look at it. It it actually reads more like an economic development um, uh, questions. Um, I would. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would expect that economic development would have a, their own input into any questionnaire that went out. So my suggestion would be come up with more questions along the conservation. Uh, well, that too, that too. But also, I think what we were trying to, what the car group was trying to do was was look at the look at kind of the balance issue. So yeah, what kind? Yeah, sure economic development do you want to see that meshes with conservation sort of you know that's that's kind of the gist is is how do you get this balance and so economic development yeah i expect they will they will submit questions or they will be interested in this and they'll have they'll probably hit some of those same areas but i i think we want we need to make sure that it's about balance and not just okay um one or the other uh, agreed. Agreed. I'd like to see more conservation. Yeah. So that's, that's, in there. That's, but, yeah, yeah. that's our homework. Yeah. Right. Um, so we can do that. And really, the other thing, I don't think that clearly got spelled out in the in the uh, 2015 POCD was what is compatible with Ashford, because I think if that were spelled out, what's compatible with our natural resources, with our waterways, you know, with our forests, with our steep slopes, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, that something like a warehouse wouldn't even have been on the table, you know, so I think it's more of looking at it, that broad picture and saying, wait, you know, it's not like we're against development because I don't think we are. It's we want development to work here. That's all. And to and our, our regulations to make sense and be sophisticated. So the other thing that um, uh, Keep Ashford Rural has done, so that website, keepashfordrural.whatever, um, we, we have just put up um, some information pieces. So two pieces by Char Charlie Vidic, um, one about buildable lots, how to make zoning regulations deal with buildable lot sizes. And that's something actually Luther brought up at the last PZC. So it's something that may have some traction, which is that, you know, just making everything be two acre lots doesn't really make sense. You have to look at the terrain and what's buildable, what's buildable on a lot and how big does a lot have to be to make something buildable. The other thing was um, uh, floodplain and those kinds of issues. So he had two pieces. Then Dan Donahue has a piece up there on um, the tax benefits of conserved land, which is kind of interesting. So, um, that group is doing a fair amount of educational stuff, which again, we talked, Loretta and I talked to Jeff about that um, the other day, last week or whenever. And he thought that that was a really good idea is educating the public about these things. So, um, you know, anyway, you might look at that website. I think they're good articles. Right. Plus I think our town, our future wants to set up something in the fall, another leadership kind of thing. And perhaps the focus would be on some of this, you know, uh, conservation and economic development rather than either or. That's just in the beginning stages, I think, of thinking about that. Right, and Jeff, again, was was kind of um, thought that that was a good idea to kind of make that be a possible um, uh, issue for a forum. For our town, our future. So, so we've got some good stuff, maybe kind of being thought about. 
that deals with the POCDM, the, the zoning regulations, because remember the moratorium that is in place is for eight months and they are now that they, because they pass the moratorium, PCC is required to make changes to um, the ICD, IDZ zone um, because of the moratorium. They are required to do that. So they have some work to do. So if we can kind of give them some information that might help them, it might be a good idea. What kind of changes are they required to do? Just they're required to update the the um, that zone. Read the moratorium. So they they made their uh, uh, Vintage sent a moratorium text amendment moratorium and they changed it and uh, made it their own and then they passed it. So they're required to look at some items or some issues and update their regulations. So, you know, read the moratorium. It's in the, it's in the um, public record for the PZC, EZC. <laughs> anyway. Does anybody else have any other comments or anything new to bring up? I just wanted to ask if we still have one opening on the Conservation Commission for another member. Yes, but it has to be a Republican or an unaffiliated. Oh, okay. Because um, uh, there's a businesswoman in town who's interested and in, would like to do this, but maybe she won't be allowed to, depending on party affiliation. I don't know what her party, she certainly can contact me. Um, and see, I mean, I there was someone who was interested, and I contacted them. I haven't heard from them, so you know, if anyone's interested, certainly. But that's what we need right now, according to to. So the, they would be I mean, down. people could come on the commission, but they're not really a member because we have all Democrats and one unaffiliated. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> So that's it. All right. Well, I thought we have one Republican. We did, but that person changed to Democrat. Oh. You can change your affiliation. Oh, my God. <laughs> Could I change? Don't you change. change your affiliation to join us. <laughs> okay, thanks. I always, I always ask the Republicans, I say, send me. You know, they're always dragging about, we don't have any. I was like, send me Republicans. They never do. I've been doing that. You know, I've been asking them for 15 years and I haven't gotten very far. <laughs> Maybe it's me. Maybe they don't want Maybe it. Maybe it's you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I don't fun. think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. All. Thank you all for being very patient with our hack. I have never had that experience in my life. And, I, and that is oh, all you I mean. right. That's all I need. I don't need another experience like that ever in my life again. So Loretta, if I don't know, do our meetings get posted on YouTube like the other ones, the recordings? Yeah, as far as I know. So you have. might you might um, give a heads up to Mike that he might well, want. I'm to going to that. email him tomorrow and say we had a problem, and he might want to edit that recording. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder. Or he might not. He might have a good time, you know. No, you have to legally because this happened once in our library computer at something like that. I had to write up an incident report, and the police have to be told because uh, if a child should walk across, I mean, if this is posted somewhere, how do you know a child can't access it and be traumatized for life? Right. I don't think it's anything more than they don't see on their cell phone every day, but that's just my opinion. We yeah, were probably more traumatized. No, there's filters out there. Right. <laughs> Loretta, you don't have hosting privileges. Is that correct? Right. I don't think I have hosting privileges, no. Because um, it, seems, it seems to me that that could solve the problem. If someone could, you know, just eliminate a person. Um, and, you know, I know that they'd have to delegate that right to somebody, but. Yeah, if tai, if tai Chi isn't running our meetings, they should give you the hosting yes. yeah, absolutely. Uh, capabilities. Absolutely. 
Well, I couldn't find anything on my screen. I pushed a lot of things, and nothing got that. that, wow. that you have no, to be the host. You have to be the host. Be the host. Yeah. Yeah. They, they can well, go, well, they, I'll, I'll follow through up on that and talk with Mike and um, yeah. have him explain what I need to do if that were to happen again, because um, yeah. we don't need to deal with that. And I will tell him that it's on the recording, so he needs to clean it up. Clean it up. <laughs> Just know they can delegate hosting authority to, right. to people. All right. right. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Well, good night, everyone. Good Pleasant night. night. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.